Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me again today. If you are new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every Wednesday and then again every Thursday as well on YouTube and you are not going to want to miss it. And I normally never plug our Instagram in the very beginning of episodes either. I usually wait till the end or it's in the description, but I thought I might as well just tell you that as well because we're starting to be more active over on Instagram. Today, I'm actually filming a day in the life on the Killer Instinct Instagram, and I also have a very exciting announcement coming up, and you will be the first to know if you follow the Killer Instinct Instagram, and it is just Killer Instinct Podcast on Instagram. It's very simple. The link is always in the description, whether it's on YouTube or you're listening to me in podcast form. It's very easy to find, but I thought I would just let you guys know before we get started. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about the unsolved disappearance of Branson Perry. Now, this case is a very, very bizarre one. It is one of those cases where Branson quite literally, it feels like, just disappeared out of thin air and no one knows what happened. I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. I know we've been doing a lot of solved and serial killer cases lately, so I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about an unsolved case. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. So Branson Perry was born on February 24th, 1981 to his parents, Rebecca and Bob Perry. He was born and raised in Skidmore, Missouri and graduated from Nottoway Holt High School. Now, Skidmore is a very small town and I feel like that word gets tossed around a lot, but Skidmore, Missouri is a very very small town. I'm talking 300 people, small town. It is the type of town where everyone knows everyone. Everyone is in each other's business. Now, if you guys remember, we did a case a while back, like a long, long time ago on Killer Instinct about a woman named Bobby Jo Stinnett. And she had her baby actually cut out of her stomach by a woman named Lisa Montgomery in 2004. Now, if you remember that case, that was also in Skidmore, Missouri, which is crazy to think about. You know, you have this insanely small town, but two very prominent true crime cases took place there, which you don't see very often. Now, Rebecca, Branson's mother, she actually worked in the gardening business and she had a greenhouse for several years and Bob, Branson's father, worked as well. Now, Branson, on the other hand, when he graduated high school, he worked some odd jobs here and there just to make some money. He worked as a roofer and he also worked at taking care of the local petting zoo in Skidmore. So two very different types of jobs, but he did excel in both of them. Now, Rebecca and Bob ended up getting a divorce in Branson's early adulthood. And when they did, Branson ended up moving in with his dad full time at the address of 304 West Oak Street in Skidmore. Now, because this is an unsolved disappearance, I am going to run you through the physical description of what Branson looked like at the time that he went missing. Branson stood at about five feet, nine inches tall, and at the time of his disappearance, weighed around 155 pounds. He has blonde hair and blue eyes with a normal build. He didn't have any body piercings at the time of his disappearance, and he has two small scars, one on his upper right cheek and one on his left knee. Branson drove a van, he was right-handed, and he didn't wear any contacts or glasses. On the day of his disappearance, he was last seen wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Now, when his parents got divorced, Branson actually discovered that he had a heart condition that he had had since birth, but it didn't go detected until his parents' divorce, and the condition is called tachycardia. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I may not be. I apologize. Now, this is a condition that makes your heart race very fast, even at its resting rate. 
Now, this was hard for Branson to hear because Branson definitely had a very active lifestyle. He liked going to the gym. He liked playing sports. He liked to do a lot of cardio. So hearing that he had this heart condition that could potentially set him back in those things that he was passionate about was very difficult for him. However, Branson figured out a way to make it work. He still was able to have an active lifestyle. He did a lot of strength training at the gym. And along with that, he even got his black belt in a form of martial arts called Hope Keto. Now, again, I think I'm pronouncing that right. I might not be. I apologize. Now, this specific form of martial arts really specializes in self-defense, which is very ironic and interesting considering the events that we are going to talk about. However, Branson, despite having this heart condition, was able to receive his black belt in this. So he was definitely not someone you wanted to mess with, which is, again, part of what makes this case so bizarre. So this case really begins on Wednesday, April 11th of 2001. And at this time, Branson was 20 years old and he was still living with his father in Skidmore, Missouri. Now, Bob, Branson's father, was actually staying in the hospital. He had been there for several days, but was scheduled to come home that Friday April 13th. Now, Branson decided that before his dad came home from the hospital, which I do want to mention, it is not really known to the public why Branson's father was in the hospital. However, we just know that he was, but Branson decided that he wanted to be a good son and he wanted to clean the place up. He wanted to get his dad's car fixed for him. So everything was going to be perfect when he came home. So on Wednesday, April 11th, Branson had called one of his friends, and this friend was a girl named Jenna Crawford. Now, Branson and Jenna had known each other for years. Again, in this type of a small town, it was hard not to know all of the people around you, but Branson and Jenna were very, very good friends. It was said that there was never anything romantic between the two of them. It was strictly platonic. Now, according to Jenna, earlier that morning, Branson had called her and asked for her help to clean up the house and just organize and tidy things up for his dad. And Jenna said that she happily agreed to do this. And shortly after, she arrived to Branson's house. Now, according to Jenna, in the beginning part of the day, everything was very normal. Nothing seemed off, nothing seemed wrong, and Branson himself was acting very normal. So Branson and Jenna are in the house and they're deep cleaning, they're vacuuming, they're organizing, they turned on the radio and they're just having a time together. Now, Jenna said around 2 p.m., one thing that she did notice was that Branson started rummaging through the cabinets and pulled something out of the cabinet. She said she didn't get a good look at what it was, but that after he grabbed it, he walked out the back door and into the backyard. She then said that a couple minutes later, he returned back into the home. And when Jenna asked what he was doing and what was going on, Branson just kind of brushed her off and didn't really give her an answer and then continued on with working. Now, Jenna said that that moment honestly wouldn't have really stood out to her at all had it not been for the events that followed later that day. Now, shortly after this all happened, Jenna decided that she was going to take a shower at Branson's house. And again, they were just really good friends. It wasn't weird. They had known each other for their entire lives. And Jenna decided that instead of going back to her house to take a shower and then coming back to Branson's, it would be easier for her to just take a shower there, which she did. I do want to say that it's never really been stated why she took a shower. Again, it's not necessary. She doesn't need to provide a reason as to why she took a shower, but just in the series of events to take a shower in the middle of your cleaning because she then went back to cleaning and organizing the house afterwards. So we're not really sure why she decided to take this shower in the middle of all of this. However, she did. Now, after she got out of the shower, she walked down the stairs back into the kitchen. And when she walks down the stairs, she is met face to face with a stranger. So she walks downstairs and she sees a man in the kitchen looking through the kitchen cabinets. 
Now, this man happened to be a man who was working on fixing Bob's car that same day. So let me explain. As I mentioned earlier, Branson was trying to fix up the house for his dad to come home, and he was also having his dad's car fixed as well. And in order to fix his dad's car, Branson brought over two mechanics. Now, these two men have actually never been named. In all of the articles that I've read and all of the videos that I have watched, these two men have never been named publicly. However, they were at the house that same day working on Bob's car. Now, Bob's car needed a new alternator, and for all my car people out there, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but from my understanding, an alternator is a generator used in the car to help keep the battery alive. Again, I'm probably missing a few things there, but that is the general basis of what it is. So at the house on April 11th, you had Jenna, you had Branson, and then outside you had these two mechanics. So there were four people at that house that day. And again, there isn't a lot of information out about these men. We don't even know their names. However, you have to remember with how small this town is, it is more than likely that Branson knew who these men were. But regardless of that, you can probably still imagine Jenna's shock when she walks downstairs after her shower and comes face to face with one of these men who is searching through the kitchen cabinets. And these were the same cabinets that Branson was looking through shortly before. Now, when Jenna saw this man, she did ask him, you know, what was he doing? Do you need anything? What are you looking for? And according to Jenna, the man got a little flustered and a little nervous, and he really didn't say anything. He just quickly made his way back outside to continue working on the car. So now this brings us to about 3 p.m. on April 11th, and at this point, Jenna was upstairs in Branson's room when she hears the front door open and shut. Now, when she hears that, she looks outside the window and she sees Branson walking towards the shed that was right next to the house. Now, this shed was basically a storage shed and it was directly adjacent to where the main house was. And Jenna called out to Branson and basically asked, you know, what are you doing? Where are you going? And that is when Branson told her that he was going to take the jumper cables that he had had in his hand at the time into the shed. And he also stated that after he did that, he was going to be running out for a minute, but he would be right back. Now, he didn't tell Jenna where he was going or if he was meeting with anyone, but all he said is that he would be right back. Now, because he said that he wasn't going to be long, Jenna decided that she was going to just wait at the house for Branson to come home. However, he never did. Now, it was around the same time that Branson left that the two mechanics that were working on Bob's car also packed up their things and left as well. And again, like I said, Jenna stayed at the house thinking that Branson was gonna come back, but he didn't. And at the time, Jenna really didn't think much of Branson not returning home. She thought it was very possible that maybe he just got caught up and lost track of time and just didn't think to call her. They did have a very sibling-like relationship, and so him not coming home, it didn't offend Jenna. It didn't make her upset or worried. She just figured, I'll catch up with him later. So now this brings us to April 12th. This is the following day and Branson's grandmother, Joanne, who was Bob's mother, so Branson's paternal grandmother, she started to get worried because Branson always came by to visit his father on a nightly basis and he didn't show up the night before on Wednesday, April 11th. She started calling him and calling the house. However, she wasn't getting any answer, which only increased her worry. So she decided that she was going to go over to the house herself. And when she got there, she noticed that all of the doors to the house were unlocked and the radio was still on from the day before. Now, Joanne didn't know that the radio had been on for an entire day because she didn't know that Branson had turned it on the day prior. Along with that, she also noticed that all of Branson's personal belongings were still in the house. I'm talking his wallet, his car keys, his car was still in the driveway. 
All of Branson's things were still there, but there was no sign of Branson anywhere. Now, with his belongings being at the house, while it did give Joanne a sense of comfort, thinking, okay, all of his stuff is here, it also brought a big sense of confusion as well, because if all of his belongings are here, why isn't he? So later that night, Joanne decided to wait and see if Branson would show up to the hospital. However, he never did. She then decided to take matters into her own hands and start calling around some of his friends to see if they had heard from him, but no one had heard from him since the 11th. So as I mentioned earlier, Bob was scheduled to be released from the hospital on April 13th. However, he actually didn't get discharged until that Monday, so on April 16th. Now, his mother did tell him through his stay at the hospital in those last couple days that no one was able to get in touch with Branson, and obviously he was aware as well because Branson was not coming to visit him at the hospital anymore. However, it wasn't until the day that he got released that he finally decided that this was very much unlike his son and he needed to take action. So he ended up calling Rebecca, which is Branson's mother, and he told her everything that was happening, and that is when on that Monday, Bob, Rebecca, and Joanne, the three of them, all went to the police station to file a missing persons report for Branson. Now, when police started their investigation, they too were very confused. They were confused about the fact that it seemed as if Branson just disappeared into thin air. They were confused about the fact that all of Branson's belongings were still at the house. They didn't know where Branson had gone to because they spoke with Jenna and she explained what had happened the day of the 11th and said that she had seen him running out to the shed to put back the jumper cables and that he said that he was going to run out really quick and be right back. They had no idea where he was running to, but they decided the first thing to do was to go to the storage shed just to look around. And when they did that, the jumper cables were nowhere to be found. And so because of that, it had police wondering, why? Why were the jumper cables not there? Did Branson not make it to the storage shed? Did he get sidetracked? Did he see someone? Because the storage shed was right next to the house, so it didn't make a lot of sense for him to not end up going there. But weirdly enough, and this is where things get so bizarre, weirdly enough, two weeks later, investigators went back to that storage shed to look through it again, and right there, hanging on the door, were those jumper cables. The jumper cables that were not found, that were nowhere to be seen just two weeks prior, were now hanging on the door. Now, this was not one of those situations where police could have just skimmed over the jumper cables or just didn't see them the first time. They were in a spot that could not be missed. Now, when police found these jumper cables two weeks later, this really made them think that whoever was responsible for Branson's disappearance, or at least had some knowledge of his disappearance, was someone that was just walking amongst everyone else in the town. Someone who would be comfortable enough to walk back to the storage shed and hang the jumper cables there. Now, Branson's family really encouraged and basically begged police to try and get any DNA or fingerprints. However, they said that due to the material of the cables, it was pretty much impossible to get any DNA off of them. Now, to this day, it has never been known how those cables got back there. And you have to remember, this was 2001, so people don't have, you know, ring doorbells or surveillance cameras outside of their properties. Police had no idea who brought these cables back. And so they were really all over this case and they were talking to everyone. They were talking to Branson's friends, his family. And when talking to his family and more specifically Bob, Bob informed police of a very disturbing and bizarre event that occurred in Branson's life just one week before his disappearance. 
Bob had told police that about a week prior to Branson going missing, he had gone over to their neighbor's house. Now this neighbor was a guy named Jason and Jason was decently older than Branson. He was about 10 years older than Branson, who again was 20 at this time. Now Branson told Bob that he just went over there to hang out with Jason, which he had done several times before and never had an experience like this. When Branson got over to Jason's house, he ended up taking some sort of drug or hallucinogenic, and it is unclear whether he knew he took it or not, so it's unclear whether he took the drug and it had side effects that he was not expecting, or if he was simply roofied by Jason. But either way, he ended up taking something. Some sort of drug got into his system and shortly after, Branson started feeling very lightheaded and he ended up undressing and dancing around without any clothes on. And after he did that, he ended up shaving his intimate areas and then Jason and him participated in sexual activity. Now, I know that that probably came out of a complete left field and a shock because it did for me as well. However, it came as the biggest shock to Branson because after whatever Branson took started wearing off, he started coming to and realizing the situation that he was in and he rushed home. He ran home and he felt so ashamed and so embarrassed. He ended up locking himself in his room for the rest of the night until the next morning when he woke up and told his dad what had happened and that is why Bob knew all of this and was able to relay it to police. Now, when Bob first heard about this, he told Branson that Branson had nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to be embarrassed about because this was not his fault. Branson was now a victim of sexual assault. And after a conversation with Bob, Branson decided that he did not want to press any charges against Jason, partially because he just wanted to forget that this had ever happened. So obviously when police heard about this, they wanted to talk to Jason, but Jason, weirdly enough, had gone MIA. He had been gone for about two weeks until he randomly showed back up at his house one day with no real explanation as to why he left. Now, police spoke to police and interrogated him pretty heavily, but ultimately ended up ruling him out as a person of interest after multiple intense interrogations. Now, police were also able to get a hold of those mechanics, those two men that were working on Bob's car that day. Now, they said that they did not see anything out of the ordinary and that they weren't really even paying attention to Branson that day. They said that they were there working on the car and after the car was fixed, they just left but they were the only two known people outside of that house that day and the only two known witnesses that could have potentially seen something. Now, like I said, police were searching everywhere in their investigation. They were looking in rivers, in farms, ponds, but nothing was coming up. And at this point in their investigation, police started to question whether or not Branson's disappearance could have been drug related. Now, in the early 2000s, the meth scene in Skidmore was at an all-time high. There was one prior instance where Branson had a run-in with a police officer regarding this. However, they can never link him to it directly. It was thought by police that Branson was working with or helping whoever was making the meth, but he wasn't necessarily directly involved. However, either way, they couldn't prove it. It was also thought that Branson could have possibly owed one of his drug acquaintances money. Police ended up interviewing over a hundred people in Skidmore. And again, there was only about 300 people who lived there, period. So they interviewed a good portion of the population in Skidmore and all of them could attest to the prominent drug scene in Skidmore. However, they couldn't really link Branson to it directly. But now this leads us to April 10th, 2003. And this is when a new man enters the picture. So almost two years to the day that Branson went missing. And I am going to tell you all about him because you are going to be shocked. 
But before we do that, we're gonna take a quick second and thank our sponsors for today's video. You're running any business, big or small, every single second counts, and you can't afford to waste a single moment. So why are you still taking the time out of your day to go to the post office when you could be using stamps.com instead? Stamps.com makes mailing and shipping quick, easy, and cost effective. I can't tell you guys how many times I have dreaded going to the post office. I quite literally will wait until the very last second to go. However, with stamps.com, I am so much more productive because I don't have to worry about going to the post office and waiting in the lines and doing all of the dreaded things that come with that place. Stamps.com saves you time, money, and stress. And for more than 20 years, they have been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. Stamps.com gives you access to all post office and UPS shipping services you need right from your computer. Streamline your shipping process with Stamps.com's easy to use software. All you need is your regular computer and printer, no special supplies or equipment. Stop wasting time and start saving money when you use Stamps.com to mail and ship. Sign up with promo code killer for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale no long-term commitment or contracts just go to stamps.com click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code killer with everything going on in the world right now it is really hard to not feel burnt out i know personally it's just it's a day-to-day -day struggle it's a day-to-day -day battle and it's only going to get crazier. I have a move coming up, I'm getting a dog, just lots of life changes happening. And so it's really hard to sometimes take enough time for yourself. And it's really important to be able to carve out that time. And life can be overwhelming and many people are burnt out without even knowing it. These symptoms can include a lack of motivation, irritability, fatigue, and more. But that's why BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. I personally have been a huge advocate not only for BetterHelp, but just therapy in general for the longest time. I've talked to you guys about BetterHelp a million times before, and I think they are incredible. With BetterHelp, you get professional counseling in the comfort of your own home. They match you with a counselor that is best deemed to fit your needs, and they have counselors that specialize in quite literally almost every single sector you could ever imagine. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with the therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash instinct. That's betterhelp.com slash instinct. So let's talk about this man who was arrested on April 10th, 2003, and that would be a man named Jack Wayne Rogers. Jack was a 59-year-old Presbyterian minister and a Boy Scout leader at the time. I don't think that could be more stereotypical for these types of cases, but Jack Rogers was arrested for his involvement in what was known as Operation Candyman. Now his arrest actually had nothing to do with Branson's case. I feel like I need to say that in the very beginning, but it is what police found afterwards that made them very suspicious. Now police found Jack because they had actually arrested a different man in Alabama for child pornography charges. And through the chat rooms that that man was involved in, they learned about Jack Rogers and that's how he was put on their radar. Police found the gruesome and graphic messages that Jack Rogers was sending in these chats about how he had tortured and murdered multiple men. In his messages, he talks about raping, torturing, mutilating, and murdering a blonde-haired man who he had picked up hitchhiking around the same time that Branson was killed. And like I mentioned earlier, Branson had blonde hair at the time of his disappearance, so this spiked police's attention. And not only did Jack Rogers go into great detail in these chats about his murderous adventures, he also advertised himself as a self-proclaimed surgeon along the way. 
Jack had stated in these chat rooms that he had been performing gender reassignment surgeries in hotel rooms, not too far from where he lived in Fulton, Missouri. And as if that was not bad enough, he then said that after these procedures took place, he would keep the genitals of all of the people that he had performed these surgeries on, and then he would eat them. And he actually justified it. He said that before he performed these procedures, he would have his patients sign a waiver that said that they consented to Jack keeping their body parts after he was done with removing them. Now, Jack also took pictures of these quote unquote surgeries that he performed. So police had all of the evidence that they needed to convict him of this. Now, the reason that police thought Jack could possibly be connected to Branson is because, like I mentioned earlier, Jack wrote in very graphic detail about murdering a blonde-haired man. Now, he didn't say that he performed surgery on this man. He just said that he tortured and killed him, and he said that the man was from Skidmore, Missouri. And again, this only raised more red flags because there really wasn't any other person who had gone missing around that time that was a blonde haired man other than Branson in Skidmore. Jack detailed that he buried this man's body in the Ozark Mountains in a remote location. So obviously, police questioned Jack about this. They interrogated him for hours about this. And Jack said that everything that he said in those chat logs was just a fantasy for him and that he had never even met Branson before. Jack said that he had seen articles that Branson had gone missing online, and so he took basically what he learned about Branson through those articles and described him in the chat room just to make it more real, but he never actually did anything to him. Now, Jack Rogers isn't the most trustworthy guy by any means. We're still talking about the same guy that was performing gender reassignment surgeries in hotel rooms and then cannibalizing his clients. So police looked through everything of his. They looked through his house, they looked through his computers, all of his electronics, his car, but they were not able to find anything that connected him to Branson other than the chat rooms. They tested multiple objects of Jack's for Branson's DNA. However, that all came up negative as well. And Jack obviously did get charged, but not for Branson's case. He was charged for possessing and distributing child sex abuse material, as well as other charges related to the surgeries that he was performing. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison and was sentenced to an extra 17 years for assault and an extra seven years for performing illegal surgery. Now at his sentencing, Rebecca, Branson's mother, she actually attended and she begged for Jack to tell her where Branson was. However, still, Jack denied knowing anything about Branson at all. Now, Jack's earliest possible release date is in 2028, which is only about six years away, which is pretty terrifying, but he will be 83 years old when he is released, if he is released in 2028. Now, like I said at first, Rebecca and a lot of people for that matter thought that Jack definitely had something to do with Branson's disappearance. However, I will say now that time has passed, Rebecca has publicly said that she does not believe that Jack was responsible. And at this point, police really don't either. So that leads us to where we're at today. So this case did turn cold after a while in 2006, and the family did everything they could to try and start this investigation again. Unfortunately, Branson's father, Bob, passed away in 2004, which was obviously devastating and heartbreaking that he had to pass away not knowing what had happened to his son. 
And so that brings us to 2009 and police started getting more tips regarding Branson. And a lot of these tips focused in on a town called Quitman, Missouri. And this was a town that was very, very popular for its drug scene at the time, as well as back in 2001 when Branson disappeared. Like I mentioned earlier, when Branson first went missing, police interviewed a bunch of people. They interviewed over a hundred people and a lot of these people were Branson's friends and some of them were just well known in the drug scene at that time. So police ended up going back in 2009 and re-interviewing a lot of those people. And what's crazy is that a lot of the people who said that they knew nothing before now had a whole different version of their story. A lot of them said that Branson was actually shot and killed and that his body had been left in Quitman in a field. So that takes us to July 8th, 2009, and authorities headed out to the field and tore it apart. They brought in cadaver dogs, and nine out of those 10 dogs narrowed in on one particular spot of that field. And when police looked closer at where the dogs were alerting to, they could see that the dirt in that spot was a different kind of dirt than what was surrounding the rest of the field. So police start digging and they are digging for a long time. I'm talking days. However, they came up with nothing. So with this wild goose chase going on that police are now on, they are able to kind of create their own theory as what they believe could have possibly happened to Branson. Now, police think that it is possible that when Branson said that he was stepping out and would be right back, they think that he could have went to a meth house in Skidmore. And they know which meth house it is. They, it's not just like some vague, you know, he went to a meth house. They know the meth house that they believe that he went to. And what's bizarre about it is that several days after Branson went missing, that house actually got burned to the ground. And the house burned to the ground before Branson's missing persons report was filed. So police, you know, they didn't have time to go and look at the house. But it does make it extra suspicious that the house would mysteriously burn down before the missing persons report was filed. Now, with that being said, police have since come out and said that there is evidence that points to the possibility that Branson's body could have been removed from the home that had burned down and taken to the field in Quitman. They believe it's possible that nine people removed his body and reburied him in that field. And then fast forward to 2009, when police got tipped off about that field in Quitman. They think it's possible that the same people who buried him there went to the field and removed his body and put it in a different location. And again, this is just a theory that police believe could be true. However, again, they have said that they do have evidence that supports this theory. So just as a basic rundown, the theory goes that Branson went to the drug house in Skidmore. He gets murdered at that house. The house burns to the ground, but before it does, those nine people take Branson's body and move it to the field in Quitman. The body stays there for about eight years until those nine people are tipped off off because the media was made aware that police were going to that field and then those nine people went back removed Branson's body and then put him in a different location so that's just the basic rundown of that theory but for me where this case feels really weird is the jumper cables those cables were missing for two weeks and then they miraculously showed up again with no rhyme or reason or thought as to who could have put them there but for someone to be comfortable enough to walk onto the property to put the jumper cables back it just raises a lot of questions because if branson took those cables to the meth house with him why not just let the cables burn to the ground as well or why not, you know, throw the cables into a pond or a lake or somewhere else? Why bring them back? Now, at this point, the case is being treated as a homicide investigation rather than a missing persons case due to the majority of the tips that have come in. And after all of this time, police do believe that they're just looking for Branson's body at this point. 
And that is really where we're at. Police really still are working on this case. However, it doesn't have the same traction as it did many years ago. Now, I will say that there is a website called Bring Branson Home, where if you do know anything, you can send in a confidential or anonymous tip. Also, if you do know anything, you can always, for any case, send in an anonymous tip to the Crime Stoppers hotline. But with this town being so small, there are multiple people in that town that know something. And hopefully Branson's family will be able to get the justice for him that they deserve. And with that being said, you guys, that is the case of Branson Perry. I am very interested to see what you guys have to say about it and what you think, whether you do believe the drug theory or if you think something totally different happened along the way. But let me know what you think. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. Again, we post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday and again, every Thursday on YouTube as well. And you are not going to want to miss it. I will be back next week with a brand new case for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys. Bye guys.